Today I'm going to show you an example problem dealing with pulleys and how we can treat systems that have two separate masses. So we'll start with a picture that looks like this. We've got mass M1 that's hanging from a string. And then there's a pulley and connected to the pulley on that's resting on a table is mass M2. <clears throat> and so first we're going to treat this as a static statics problem. So there's gonna be some friction force on M2 that's keeping it stationary. And then after we treat that, we're going to move on to uh, what the equation of motion looks like if the coefficient of friction is less than the static coefficient of friction that we find in part one. Okay, so first we're going to treat these as two separate objects. So for mass M1, our free body diagram looks like this. We have tension pointing up and we'll call it force of tension acting on block one. And then we have force of gravity acting on block one. Now for mass two, Since it was sitting on the table, we have normal pointing up, gravity pointing down. There will be a friction force and then a tension force T2. Now, one of the assumptions that we're going to make for this problem is that this pulley that was connecting M1 and M2, we're going to say that this is a massless pulley. And so now, because this is a massless pulley, and let's say that there's no friction on the pulley, Now there will be no energy loss because this pulley has to rotate. If it had mass or if there was friction, then the rotation of this pulley uh, would change this problem up. So that's a problem that we can work on later. So if, there's, if this pulley is massless and there's no friction, now we can use Newton's third law to say that the force of tension on block one has to equal the force of tension on block two, and we'll just call that the force of tension, okay? So now that's how we're going to equate these two free body diagrams. So if we look at mass one, we had tension going up, gravity going down. And now if this is a statics problem, some of the forces in the Y equals zero. I guess we'll say some of the forces equals MA. And then because it's static, there's no acceleration. So you get some of the forces in the Y equals zero. Of course, there are no forces in the X, but it's also not moving in the X. So you basically end up with zero equaling zero, which is fine. Now back in the Y direction, we have tension pointing up, force of gravity acting on block one pointing down. Solving for tension and then plugging in that the force of gravity is mass one 
times g. So now this tension has to be the same as the tension acting on block two. So when we look at our block two diagram, normal pointing up, gravity pointing down, tension to the left, friction to the right. Now we'll see some of the forces in the X equals MAX. And then some of the forces in the Y equals MAY. So for a static problem, again, there are no accelerations. So the right hand side of both of these equations goes to zero. So since we're interested in tension, let's work on that side first. So we have the force of friction on block two minus the force of tension equals zero. So solving for friction, we get that it equals the force of tension. We remember that the tension that we solved for previously, so from block one, force of tension was M1G. So we can plug that into our equation. And then we replace force of friction with mu static because it's a static problem times the normal force acting on block two. So now we see if we want to find the static coefficient of friction, we need the normal force. So we go into the y direction to do that. So we have the normal force on two pointing up, the gravitational force on two pointing down. So solving for the normal force has to equal the gravitational force on two. And then plugging in M2G into the gravitational force. We can now take this and plug it in for here. And doing that. We get mu s times m2g equals m1g. So the gravitational forces cancel out. Solving for mu s, you get m1 over m2. <clears throat> so basically your coefficient of friction needs to be greater than the ratio between mass one and mass two in order for the block to stay, or for the whole system to stay stationary. Okay, so now what if we treat the case where the coefficient of friction is less than m1 over m2. So now we'll revisit our, our picture. m1 fully m2. Now, if, <clears throat> if this, so if block M1 is accelerating, then block M2 also has to be accelerating. Uh, so one way that we can think about this problem is kind of to reimagine it. So instead of having a coordinate system, instead of leaving our picture like this and having our coordinate system look like this, where positive Y points up and positive X points to the right. Uh, what if instead we imagine the system looking like this? So now I'm going to reimagine this as a one-dimensional problem and I'm going to say that the left direction is positive. 
So in this reimagined system, where to the left is positive. Now we have a gravitational force pulling to the left on block M1. We have a tension force pulling on both of the blocks. So that's going to be an interior force. So that's not really going to matter. Um, it's just helpful to if you wanted to treat each mass separately like we did in part one. So we have now our two blocks laid out like this, where we're reimagining our system. And now instead of treating the blocks separately, I'm going to treat the whole block one and block two as a system. So this in the dotted box is one is our system. So now if we look at the forces acting on the system, We'll have force of gravity acting on block one, and we'll have force of friction acting on block two. Now, of course, to figure out what this force of friction two equals, we'll have to use our free body diagram of just block two. because we need to know that the normal force acting on block two is e equal to the gravitational force, which is M2G. And so this is just the same as it was in the previous part of the problem. So I'm not gonna go into that in too much detail. But now for our system, We'll have some of the forces in the Y is zero, and we're not really gonna pay attention to that because that's just gonna be zero equals zero. But then some of the forces in the X equals MA. This is what we want. And now we have to be careful about this M because this is M for the whole system, which is M1 plus M2. So some of the forces in the X is M1 plus M2 times A. Are some of the forces acting on our system are the gravitational force acting on block one, and the friction force acting on block two. So the gravitational force on block one is M1G. The friction force is mu times the normal force acting on block two. And we know the normal force acting on block two is M2G. Let's get our system mass on the right hand side of our equation. Now solving for acceleration, 
we are for first going to factor out this g term from both sides on the left, or from both terms on the left hand side, and then divide by the system mass times m1 minus mu kinetic times m2. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Keep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.